OK, great. Good afternoon, everyone from London, or it might be good morning or good evening, depending on what time you're watching this. Thank you very much for joining us today. Welcome to this online side event ahead of the intercessionals on the health related aspects of drug policy at the Commission on Narcotic Drugs next week. This side event is titled The Role of Harm Reduction in a Comprehensive Approach to Drugs. My name's Anne Fordham. I'll be moderating the panel today in my capacity as chair of the Strategic Advisory Group to the UN on HIV and drug use. This event is co-organized by the Ministry of Health of Norway, the Federal Ministry of Health of Germany, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands, UNAIDS, WHO, UNDP, UNODC, and the International Drug Policy Consortium, the International Network of People Who Use Drugs, Harm Reduction International, Frontline AIDS, and Open Society Foundations. Today's side event is organized ahead of the thematic discussions next week, and these thematic CND discussions seek to address the remaining challenges for the global community in drug-related matters, as outlined in the 2009 ministerial statement. That statement recognized that the rate of transmission of HIV, hepatitis C, and other blood-borne diseases associated with drug use remains high. Although we have a global commitment to end AIDS by 2030, also enshrined in the 2016 UNGAS outcome document, the lack of political and financial commitment to the global harm reduction response means that the HIV epidemic amongst people who inject drugs continues unabated. People who inject drugs are 29 times more at risk of HIV than compared with the general population. This elevated risk is driven by an inadequate coverage of harm reduction services and is reinforced by criminalization, marginalization, stigma and discrimination. While the incidence of HIV infections globally declined by 23% between 2010 and 2019, HIV infections amongst people who inject drugs increased in several regions. Furthermore, there is a funding crisis for harm reduction programmes around the world. Our colleagues at Harm Reduction International have estimated that the financial support for an effective HIV response for people who inject drugs in low and middle income countries was 188 million US dollars in 2016. This is just one tenth of the 1.5 billion that is needed to prevent HIV amongst people who use drugs. And the current context of the global COVID-19 pandemic has also brought additional challenges to ensuring the health and rights of people who use drugs and as such brings an urgent extra imperative to this discussion. So we have a great panel for you today to address the different intersecting aspects of harm reduction in drug policy and I'm pleased that we have a diversity of views represented from government, from the UN and from civil society and community representatives. So thank you for joining us. I will be introducing my panel in turn um, as they come up to speak. So for today's format, we'll have short initial interventions from each of our speakers. Um, I hope I'll have time to ask a couple of follow up questions um, to our panelists. And then if there's time, if you've asked questions in the Q&A function, we will try to address those as well. But time is a little short um, for today. So I'm delighted to invite our first speaker. Her Excellency Ambassador Kirsty Andersen. She's the permanent re representative of Norway to the UN in Vienna, and she will give the opening speech today. And thank you again to Norway for co-sponsoring this event with us and your consistent support and commitment to civil society engagement at the CND. So thank you for joining us, Ambassador. You have the floor. Uh Thank you um, very much for the invitation uh, to participate today. Now, Norway, Norway welcomes this discussion on harm reduction within the context of the CND uh, very much. And we last did this together during the 62nd session of the CND in March 2019 seems uh, like a very long time ago, but it really isn't. Um, I also welcome the collaboration with civil society and the representatives of people who use drugs. It's critical to ensure the meaningful particip participation and involvement uh, of those most affected. I also greatly appreciate the cross UN support for this event. Now, um, I'm very pleased also to note that the CND has adopted several Norwegian initiated resolution 
uh, over the years, demonstrating the political commitment to uphold the health and rights of people who use uh, drugs and to address HIV and viral hepatitis among the population. I will not go into details about the resolutions, um, but resolution 62-7, 62-6, and also resolution 60-8. Now, the CND resolutions and the UNGAS outcome document demonstrate that health and human rights are central to our deliberations on global drug policy. Um, I would also like to say a few words um, on the process of the Norwegian drug policy reform. In some way, the Norwegian reform has its origin in a call several organizations of people who use or have used drugs made upon our politicians just before the UNGAS 2016. They wanted to change the current policy on illicit drugs. Now, they demanded a national drug policy in accordance with human rights, that their voices should be heard in the process, and that um, we should see decriminalization of use and possession of illicit drugs for personal use. And it should not be replaced by any other repressive or coercive measures. Our Minister of Health and Care Services, Mr. Bent Hoye, paid attention. And in 2018, a drug policy reform became the official policy of the current government. The purpose of the reform is to, and now I quote, ensure better services for people suffering from substance use disorders through transferring responsibility for society's response to use and possession of illicit drugs for personal use from the justice sector to the health and care sector. Now, by the spring of 2018, the government appointed a public committee to explore and assess a model for the drug policy reform, and the committee delivered its report in December 2019. The committee proposed a general decriminalization of use, possession and acquisition of illicit drugs within threshold quantities. And then it's for personal use. It does not distinguish between recreational use or harmful use or between different types of illicit drugs. Use or possession of illicit drugs will no longer have any criminal implications. Instead, the individuals will be transferred to the municipal health and care services and met by counselling. And if needed, and only by consent, health and social welfare services. Now, the government made it clear that the reform is no step towards legalisation of any kind of illicit drugs, but points out at the same time that this will not interfere with the more emphasis on harm reduction. So, by now the government is about to decide uh, on the model proposed by the committee, uh, if it's to be implemented as it is, or if any adjustments should be made. And the issue is a hot topic in the Norwegian public debate. And even though Parliament seems to be in favour of a reform as such, many find the proposal too radical. So, there's a political discussion. The government's objective is nevertheless to make the necessary decisions and amendments to that law by 2021. So that's the status, that's the update, and I know that many of you have listened to my Minister of Health before, um, and uh, we will. We know that many follow this uh, reform process with great interest. So I think I'll stop there. Uh, thank you so much for your attention, and I really look forward to the rest of this uh, discussion. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Um, we're really so grateful that you could join us today. And you're right. I mean, I think so many of us around the world um, are following um, the Norwegian developments with interest. And of course, what we've seen so far in terms of the considered way that Norway has taken this approach, the long period of consultation, looking at different models um, has been really inspiring. So I think we'll be continuing to, to watch closely and, and hope that Norway will keep um, sharing um, as you move forward in this process. Um, so our next speaker, I'm delighted to welcome Louisa Cabal. Louisa is the Acting Interim, Interim Director of the Community Support, Social Justice and Inclusion Department at UNAIDS. Um, Louisa, you'll be speaking about removing stigma and ensuring non-discrimination towards people who use drugs, um, lessons learned from the Global Partnership for action to end all forms of HIV related stigma and discrimination. So welcome Louisa, you have the floor. 
Thank you, Anne. Uh, I'm delighted to join the fellow panelists um, in this uh, in this panel. Um, I, let me start by saying, like the ambassador just mentioned, that we all know that human rights barriers, stigma, and discrimination uh, remain rampant and are a critical obstacle to what we have been or what we are trying to discuss today. So what I'd like to contribute today is how the global partnership to end HIV stigma and discrimination can be a platform to advance some of the goals that we, we are discussing today. Before I describe the partnership, let me just share with you three core premises of this, uh, of this partnership. Uh, first is around, we know that to tackle stigma and discrimination, we need not just legal strategies, but we need also cultural attitudinal shifts for this change. So this partnership is based on really addressing all the forms of stigma uh, around HIV, people who use drugs to live empowered, fulfilling lives and enjoy healthy lives. The second, the second premise of this partnership, again, it's an intersectional approach to stigma discrimination. It's an invitation to break silos, as it, we're not just looking at HIV in isolation, but we're looking at the multiple and intersecting forms of discrimination, uh, stigma based on drug use, on sex work, on sexuality, on gender identity, race, to all bring us together uh, to really look at, at the complexity and the need to um, multiple uh, intersecting approaches to address it. And the, third, the third premise um, is that change is needed in all of the different spaces in which human beings interact. Uh, it is not enough to just address stigma in one sector, such as the healthcare sector. I think uh, communities and civil society really pushed us, as I'll describe when we were developing the partnership, to prioritize six different sectors when, where we need change. And these are the justice sector, healthcare, employment, education, the community and the family, and the humanitarian settings. So these are the, the three sort of under undercurrents of premises under which this partnership is built. So what is the partnership? Just very briefly, uh, a few years ago, two years ago, uh, in a in a board discussion at, at UNAIDS, there was a big push from civil society, the communities telling the UN and governments, it, we need to bridge the gap between commitments and action. And they really asked the UN to join forces with the global network of people living with HIV, with the PCB NGO delegation to launch this partnership, precisely to move from words and commitments into actions at national level. Another key goal is to provide the guidance of what we know works. Sometimes we repeat, we know what works, but we're not making available in, in simple ways and advocating for the scale up of interventions of what works. And then to also come together to address the, the barriers that affect uh, many of these populations, inclu including uh, criminalization. So 18 countries have already joined this partnership. And this partnership is not just about, about signing a piece of paper and forgetting about it. It's actually around pledging action in the initial year on three core settings. And I would like to um, share with you the concrete the concrete entry points I would find for all of us as we as we move on to use this partnership. There are 18 countries and many of these 18 countries have prioritized the healthcare sector and the justice sector as entry points for movement. We have a concrete uh, entry point for our communities to engage uh, and GNP plus is being very active in this uh, 18 countries to really push whether it's law reform, prison reform, or in the health sector to address uh, curriculum changes to make sure that sti stigmatizing attitudes are removed and changed. I also want to stress that the Global Fund has joined this partnership. What we're trying is also move from commitments into actions by making sure that the linkages and the synergies with the Global Fund are made so that whatever recommendations and actions are identified at national level can be inserted in funding, in funding proposals to the Global Fund. Two final notes, two final notes. One is the opportunity for collaboration. 
this is a platform that is seeking to bring different movements together to break silos for joint action and national level. So um, I will end my remarks with, with, with one request and, and one offer. Um, we need all of your help to make sure that this partnership is not just about the UN or a few organizations, but we really are working and GNP Plus is really in the lead in working with our technical working group composed from diverse organizations around the world in making this really a, a movement and a partnership where grassroots organizations are represented and are, and are leading this effort at national level. So we, we hope to hear from many of you on how we can continue to work together to make this platform a, a very useful tool. Thank you. Thank you so much, Louisa, and for these important perspectives on how to address um, stigma and discrimination um, more broadly, but also, you know, understanding that, yeah, how stigma and discrimination um, affects people who use drugs directly, um, especially via kind of the, the well, the lack of an enabling environment and criminalization. And we hear your call to, to be ready to support and assist in this because it really is central um, to the discussion also at the CND where there has been um, also a resolution um, several years ago that focused on stigma, a couple of years ago that focused on stigma and discrimination and ongoing work by UNODC to um, address this important issue as well for people who use drugs. So thank you very much. Um, moving to our next speaker, we have Aditya Taslim or Adit. Adit is the incoming executive director of Ruma Chimera. He is a person who uses drugs. He's an advocate, an activist, a husband and a father of two. Um, he's been involved with Ruma Chimera, a community based organization for people who use drugs in Bandung, Indonesia since 2005, working very closely on providing community led services to people who use drugs and people living with HIV as well doing as well as doing work on advocacy on drug policy in Indonesia in the region of, of Southeast Asia but also um, at the international level. Adit will be presenting today on scaling up community-led services. Thank you so much for joining us Adit. Thank you and for the brief introduction I'm happy to be here sharing a little bit of our experience from Indonesia um, our organization has been involved in delivering harm reduction services since the very beginning of the national programming back in 2005. And I still recall how we, the community of people who use drugs, would discreetly hand it out clean needles and syringes on the street, hoping that we would not get caught by the police. And many of us were, were not lucky at the time. Um, it was either peer outreach workers caught by the police or uh, people who use drugs uh, never got access to harm reduction services. Um, and I just would like to also continue from the previous speaker, Louisa. Thank you so much for bringing up such critical aspects and gaps um, in achieving our global targets. Stigma and discrimination continue to become one of the major barriers um, to the community, especially in advancing community-led responses. Um, we know that it keeps people away from um, services and also lead to significant reduction in funding towards um, life-saving interventions like harm reduction, peer outreach work, um, access to NSP, methadone, naloxone, and especially with more and more countries are moving towards domestic financing. And Indonesia is among those countries in transition and we have seen how political willingness and um, policy environment were not taken into account when donors decided to pull out their funding. In short, we have seen a lot of harm reduction services being discontinued and um, communities are not getting any investment. And so what happened to us, to the community, and regardless of the lack of funding and investment, we continue to deliver our work um, and often with limited funding or even no funding at all. And so we do this because we know that harm reduction saves lives. And this also pushes us to um, become experts in the field by um, trying to generate evidence, um, engage in studies, monitoring mechanisms, and continue pushing the advocacy agenda. I don't have much in my slides, but I only have pictures and a bit of story. So if we can go to the next slide, please. And the next one.
this is there um person who used drugs who inject drugs on methadone and he was selected as uh, one of our players for 2019 homeless world cup in cardiff um as part of our sports and development program uh, the tournament took place over 10 days but our national policy on methadone only allows three day take home dose and a maximum seven day dose um, for exceptional situation, which in this case, it required clarification and written approval from um, the Ministry of Health, which we did eventually, but still, um, he needed more than seven days and the remaining dose were not covered. And our government and health facilities were, they were playing by the book only. And then he was at risk of not getting his supply. And just for your information, this has been his dream um, to be part of this tournament. So we got connected with a community-led service in Cardiff and managed to get the remaining dose over there. So he was able to fulfill his dream of participating in Homeless World Cup without risking his health and his life-saving needs. And this is what the kind of work that community-led services does, one of them. Um, let, can we have the next slide? So we also respond to um, emerging um, changes and needs. And if you look at the next slide, um, this is a very recent one in Indonesia. So there's been a shift in the dark drug market in the last seven years that we have seen heroin became uh, unavailable and in, 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 across the countries. It was difficult to get and came in very, very high price if it was um, available. So this led to a low uptake in harm reduction services as more and more people shifted towards other drugs, mostly um, and amphetamine and and stimulant types. And so consequently, this also event um, lead to several services being shut down because nobody accessing NSP, nobody accessing harm reduction services, and there is no um, st stimulant or ATS uh, based services um, currently available. While um, we also see that this harm reduction slowly being removed, removed from the national agenda and discussion. And However, in the last few years, we have seen the re-emerging of um, the market. Um, it came back and it was actually us, the community, who first found out and we quickly initiated a rapid assessment um, on, on the current market situation on the basis of keeping harm reduction agenda on the table as well as to avoid the risk of increasing number of opioid overdose cases because people haven't actually been using heroin for so many years and then suddenly, boom, the market came back. Um, and the result of the study was used to, to make informed decisions among policymakers, including the Global Fund Country Grant proposal for the next cycle in Indonesia, which now harm reduction remains in the agenda, including overdose management component. Um, and this is uh, uh, one example of how community-led responses can also um, provide, provide a very uh, relevant and, and um, accurate information and evidence. Uh, can we go over the next slide, please? And it saves lives, like right? our response to communities, we save lives and then we know that we we are doing this because we know how that can save lives. Um, the next picture. Next slide now. So the role of community-led services continue to be challenged and we know that and we're not being recognized, we know that. And despite that we've been doing this for so many years since the very beginning of the response and as well as evidence that's been generated, there's so many um, by community-led, by key population-led, by civil society organization, by donors, UN partners and other philanthropies. Um, and also we know that while donors continue to transition out from providing direct support to community-led responses, um, we have to make sure that the evidence continue to be generated and because we know that the role of peer and community-led support in achieving the target, the, the global target, needs to be captured. And so earlier this year, we conducted a peer-led research on case management and ART access to capture how peer engagement can influence access adherence and quality of care and the study the study suggests strong links to simplifying complex service bureaucracy um, generating confidence and trust among peers developing social health integration and improving adherence to um, antiretroviral therapy 
But peer-led case management improves the quality of health. And this is one of the things that we also conduct. Uh, we, we, we lead researches and also we, we, we generate evidence on our roles and also the, um, what we can contribute to the global health targets. Um, last slide, please. And in closing, I would like to remind everybody, um, and particularly to the um, Commission um, on Na of Narcotics Drug, uh, that there is enough evidence around the world on the role of community-led services and responses. Yet, we have seen the commitment from governments in meeting the target of 30% investment to community-led services and a 6% on social enablers, as set out in the 2016 political declaration. We are reaching the milestone of our global target now in 2020. And the question is how far we have we invested in these two critical pillars? And if we are serious about ending AIDS as a public health threat, then we need to recognize the communities, their roles and what they can contribute. We need to start measuring the investment. We need to rejuvenate greater and meaningful involvement of people living with HIV and people who use drugs in the design, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation. So we ask the Commission on Narcotic Drug to echo the 2016 political declaration on ending AIDS and to consider adopting a um, resolution to reaffirm the commitment uh, to the 30% target on community-led services. And I'll give it back to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I did, and it's really great to hear about these examples from Indonesia of you know where community has been leading and what kind of impact that has. And you know, in addition to leading on providing services and and peer um, to peer services, but also in terms of monitoring and data collection, you know, um, informing government responses about the drug market, it really is so critical. And I think you're also right to to see how this conversation also needs to be brought into the discussion um, in Vienna, because obviously those commitments have been made within the HIV AIDS political discussions. But I hope that we can take this discussion also up in the, in the setting of the CMD. Um, so moving on to our next speaker, um, who will be sharing the experience on the ground um, from India and also on the same theme of how communities of people who use drugs have responded under the challenges brought by COVID-19. Um, welcome to Sharan Sharma. Sharan is the program manager um, on drug use and harm reduction at Alliance India. He brings nearly two decades of professional experience in the fields of drug use, HIV and human rights for people who use drugs. Um, and as an activist, he has been strongly associated as part of the global harm reduction movement. He's also a founding member and currently an advisor to the Indian Drug Users Forum, and he started his association with harm reduction as a peer educator. Um, so, Sharan, you have the floor. Oh, Sharan is on mute. Uh, sorry, I'm unmuting you. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Um, I'm uh, excited and delighted to be part of this um, very interesting panel discussion. Um, much uh, before the um, COVID lockdown, um, soon after my return from the CND early this year, um, I started alerting our um, state and the national uh, network of drug users. Uh, about the COVID pandemic and mm, the National HIV program on the um, advisory that we received uh, through the input e-list as well as other international uh, forums that I'm, I'm part of. So after the um, COVID um, outbreak uh, during the initial uh, days of lockdown, as anticipated, the uh, movement of uh, drug users has been negatively impacted uh, because of the random arrests by the police and the local pressure groups like the local student union or the clubs and even up to the extent of you know um, harassing um, people um, in the public uh, right in the middle of the street um, you know making them 
do funny things, which is quite actually very humiliating. So this led to um, uh, the this led to drug users finding it very difficult and cutting off their regular supply of drugs. And more importantly, the essential um, services that they require uh, from the from the drop-in center. So service providers were not available um, as their offices and the drop-in center were closed due to the tra travel rest uh, restriction imposed. Uh, this resulted in a larger number of people who use drugs out of rates, out of services, as the outer services were totally set. We are already um, stigmatized and discriminated population, and COVID uh, added another layer, uh, compounding the ex existing situation more challenging for us. The situation um, constructed more barriers rather than paving ways for us uh, to access um, the harm reduction services. Um, incidents of um, suicide committed um, among the drug users were reported uh, by the State Drug Users Forum, and it happened inside jail inside hospital when people were taking treatment off their to take care of their withdrawal uh, and at their homes. Many felt, many of us uh, felt that it could be uh, attributed to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic because of isolation, because of not uh, able to speak to people, because of fear of getting infected with, with, with COVID. So it is actually a mental health issue for which we have been demanding, requesting support for treatment, but not heard seriously uh, till now. A bigger challenge was the uh, overdose related uh, death and incidents that were reported. And uh, we knew that it was going to increase. And this was anticipated by many, um, many, many of our peers from the field that uh, um, the incidence of overdose is going to increase. So it was um, uh, and heads up and alert was actually sounded. But unfortunately, uh, two of our um, peers, <clears throat> they died of overdose inside the uh, quarantine center. In, this was in, in, in Manipur because like uh, the nurse or the doctor or the healthcare worker over there in the quarantine center didn't know what actually, you know, what how, how to respond. So as <clears throat> support were limited and far cry uh, for us, for the network of uh, drug users started uh, responding with a little bit of funding or, or no funding from the government. Um, but with some financial support contributed by the uh, community-based organization and some individuals, uh, the State Drug User Forum took the initiative of providing essential harm reduction services, uh, services even to the extent of delivering at the at the doorstep. So the, the regular services were not able to provide even uh, clean needle and syringes, but then like the drug users, we stepped in and we started providing going up to the doorsteps of individual drug users to, to ensure that they have access to services, whether it is uh, OST or whether it is um, needle syringe. And surprisingly, some of the groups that came up to support um, um, nutrition or dry ration or a sanitary uh, pad, uh, PPE kit, and even money, uh, were you know the faith-based organization so this was quite surprising to many of us that the faith-based organization could be quite helpful to the community of people who use drugs even though the arrest of people who use drugs continues member of the network started reaching out to the police station uh, to provide um, buprenorphine i have a picture on that and if jess could quickly put it up to show it to the audience or to the to the people.
Yeah, so this is a um, picture of one of our um, members from the Manipur State Drug User Forum uh, providing um, buprenorphine in the uh, police station. Thank you. Yeah, so um, the drug user uh, network members started reaching out to the uh, senior police officials and the uh, senior bureaucrats from the health department requesting them to um, you know stop um, arresting drug users but rather refer them to um, center home where um, some of the uh, CBOs and NGO they came together to set up a center home where um, um, harm reduction services were provided, food were provided, um, information about COVID, uh, how to kind of, you know, uh, protect themselves from getting infected and clothing, even clothing were provided uh, by the um, by the CBOs and, and NGOs and some uh, individual and some individual I'm referring to some of the uh, members of the drug using community. So COVID-19 in in um, in a way is is blazing in disguise for one um, 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 service that is take home doses of overdose. Uh, sorry, take home doses of OST was finally implemented with an advisory from the National AIDS Control Organization that it should be given for at least one week of um, buprenorphine doses to all the individuals who are on buprenorphine. So um, with the community of people who use drugs um, have been kind of advocating for this uh, for the last eight to uh, nine years. So I mean, like we are, we, are, we, we, were, we were quite excited, but um, uh, with this excitement, um, the um, other part that was actually neglected was that uh, the people who were getting into the OST program, but then like people who were still injecting didn't have access to clean needle and syringes so that was a major concern uh, that a lot of us has brought it up with the uh, officials of the state as well as at the at the national um, at the national forum um, in India for the first time the methadone program which is relatively quite strictly implemented um, have also started uh, providing uh, methadone take-home doses for about three to four days and this was purely due to the pressure from the community that uh, we need to have access to uh, methadone. But in spite of the advisory from NACO um, to provide one week take home doses for buprenorphine, some of the state um, uh, did not implement that and this has actually angered and compelled the uh, the uh, groups or the network of people who use drugs to write uh, letter to the Minister of Health, to the Minister of Social Welfare and to the National AIDS Control Organization and State AIDS Control Society who are actually uh, respons responsible for implementing the OST program in the in, in, in the state. So this also demonstrate, um, you know, the community can also advocate at the highest level in, in, in the country. So community members also have generated evidence from the field, shared um, testimony, uh, develop monitoring mechanism and continue advocating to ensure that essential harm reduction services are accessible and uninterrupted. Um, after this, uh, yes, I have the slide that shows the um, picture of um, um, of the drug user uh, forum member uh, administering naloxone to one of the um, um, to one of our peer who had uh, audit. So I actually had a, um, um, the a record a quotation that was actually provided by the um, by the person after he recovered. He shared with us that he actually had injected uh, more um, heroin thinking that um, it would prevent uh, him from coming out from home in the evening um, um, and, you know, uh, to also avoid getting arrested by the police. So in order to do that, he thought that he would inject more so that it could last longer for the night 
uh, but then unfortunately um, it didn't happen that way. He he audited, and um, but then uh, people were there to respond to the overdose, and fortunately we were able to save his life. So we have actually saved about um, 68 lives of overdose. Unfortunately, about three of them we could not save because they were not reported in time. So in um, in India. Uh, the uh, the drug user network um, led the advocacy with the UN, with CCM, with National AIDS Control Organization, with support from civil society and other HIV um, uh, health activists for emergency support for people who use drugs. And, th and this led to other networks of sex workers, MSM and transgender joining us um, and intensifying the advocacy effort. And I'm happy to share that uh, uh, this has resulted in um, in 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 securing 10 million uh, US dollar from the global fund for India, specifically for uh, HIV key population. This will be provided to the community, and no other um, cost would be uh, deducted from here. It's purely for the for the community. So um, widespread. Uh, criminalization and punishment of people who use drugs confirms that the war on drug is, in fact, uh, you know, war on drug user. It is extremely difficult to get HIV and Hep C treatment when they are incarcerated or detained or hiding from the fear of um, arrest. Um, said that. Um, the evidence generated from the field clearly indicates that the challenges and barrier does not end it, and, and it, it continues and it will continue uh, for people to access to harm reduction services. Uh, without doubt, we witness drastic changes when community is involved in harm reduction implementation. The action, ownership, commitment, uh, enthusiasm is explicitly evident that the uh, people who use drugs are the frontline responder even before the COVID, during the COVID, and will continue to do so. We need to seriously think and take action on uh, meaningful involvement of people who use drugs in, in program implementation at the local, at the state, at the national, at the regional, or at, or even at the global level. Uh, network and forums should be funded alongside with harm reduction program. There's no debate required that harm reduction certainly save life. Um, I will leave it to the um, to the audience um, to decide and take a call uh, who is listening to our discussion. And my concluding remark is from a from a from a quote from His Holiness uh, the Dalai Lama. Our prime purpose in this life is to help other. If you can't help them, at least don't hurt them. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, so, you much. so much, Sharon, for the important words. Those perspectives also from India. I mean, of course, it's terrible to to hear about some of the things that have been happening to people um, under the COVID pandemic um, restrictions, but also some really positive news from India around what community has managed to do to um, ensure a continuation of harm reduction services, to advocate um, for take home methadone. I know many people have been talking about that development in India is very positively and also congratulations for the incredible joint advocacy that you've done with other key populations that has led to this investment from the Global Fund in India. That's that's no small thing. So that's really great um, to hear. Um, so we'll be moving on to our final speaker today. Um, I'm pleased to introduce Yulia Georgieva from Bulgaria. Yulia is the chair of the Center for Humane Drug Policy, and she will be speaking about um, a very serious um, concern and issue relating to the global harm reduction response, which is about the funding gap um, and resulting lack of coverage um, of harm reduction programs in Bulgaria specifically, but also in her region and beyond. So Yulia, thank you for being on the panel today. You have the floor.
I thank you for the invitation. Um, thank you very much. I'm extremely impressed how the how, how the people from the community of people who use drugs in uh, Indonesia and India uh, deals with the problems. So for, unfortunately, we wasn't so strong on the right time. Uh, and at the moment, uh, we are in front of uh, one very serious problem. We are in the very serious problem already uh, regarding the harm reduction of funding in uh, my country, but uh, the situation is uh, almost the same everywhere on the Balkans. Uh, at the beginning, I need to add uh, just that uh, we know that middle income countries are increasingly vulnerable as donors, uh, are either reduce or withdraw, withdraw funding. Uh, and there are some governments who are investing uh, in domestic health and uh, HIV responses. Unfortunately, unfortunately uh, the politicians in Bulgaria are not a good example about it. Uh, the history is uh, started in uh, 2003 when the Global Fund uh, signed uh, the contracts with the government and uh, we used to be very successful uh, country regarding HIV prevention uh, among the vulnerable population uh, during almost 15 years. Uh, but in July 2017, uh, all harm reduction activities were stopped in Bulgaria for the first time uh, because of the lack of funding um, after the, the global fund withdrawal. <laughs> this, exactly after the withdrawal. Uh, the next funding was insured two years later. Uh, we stayed two years without any needle to needle and syringe exchange in the country, case management and testing. Uh, the, 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 the next funding was ensured two years later in July 2019, but only for a year with the amount of, uh, the amount of 181,000 euro per, per the whole country, uh, which is a very, very small amount, unfortunately. Uh, in the end of June 2020, all harm reduction services stopped again for the second time. Uh, and the oldest and more experienced uh, harm reduction organization, Initiative for Health Foundation, uh, needed to shut down because of because of lack of funding and uh, no way to see the future, how, how, how to deal with the future. Uh, it was very interesting uh, that new public procurement was open uh, again, in the end of August 2020, uh, but uh, it excludes the most vulnerable groups as people who use drug sex workers and uh, men who make sex, uh, sex with men in the four biggest areas in the country. When the previous program used to work during the previous procurement period, uh, those four biggest areas in the country was cut from for me. Uh, Unfortunately, there is a similar problem in Bosnia Herzegovina, where the only remaining harm reduction organization, Margina, has run, run out of funds. And as far as I know, they have money for something like two months and going, uh, also going to shut down. Uh, we expect the sa same scenario in Albania, and the situation is very complex in Romania and Greece too. I need uh, to say that we can see that our governments have great difficulties in the successful transition from international fund funding to local or national funding, uh, even in the cases with the successful programs like uh, one, like the one funded by Global Fund in Bulgaria. Uh, Bulgaria can demonstrate success when working in cooperation with the international institutions and organizations, uh, but has serious problem in continuing the effective action implementing during these periods after the international funding has been uh, withdrawn. The vulnerable groups that are key for the successful harm reduction activities like people who use drugs, low-level MSMs, sex work, worker, workers, vulnerable uh, Roma groups are not politically attractive, to be honest. Uh, too often, being tough of them may look um, more favorable and popular for political image and re-election purposes. Unfortunately, after the, with the withdrawal of the international donors, the national authorities start to apply standard bureaucratic procedures that are often very unsuitable uh, for NGOs funding. Uh, the focus is on being safe from legal and administrative challenges and not on delivery of effective harm reduction services. As a result of that, in our country, all the harm reduction services have stopped for the second time. Uh, in addition, the state relies on well-established internal funding mechanisms uh, like public procurement that are failed to ensure the effectiveness of harm reduction and public health programs. 
Uh, public procurement is a rigid business target mechanism. The main requirement is uh, the financial value. The cheapest offer is uh, preferable, not uh, the most effective for a public health one. Uh, the amounts of the funding are very small and there is uh, no clear monitoring of the effectiveness of the prison service contractors. As a result, fund, for funding gaps that could occur, they, they need at least seven months between uh, the procedures uh, started and uh, this uh, public procurement guarantee that every time we will have at least seven months gap between the funding for the harm reduction in the country. Uh, the, our governments, we can see that our governments uh, don't have the capacity to manage several key complex public uh, health programs together. Uh, COVID pandemic has effectively killed the HIV programs in countries like Bulgaria. Uh, there is no political will uh, to think about different kind of epidemics uh, as HIV when we have COVID problems at the moment. Uh, we have several recommendations. Uh, we really, really hope that maybe someone can help us. Uh, one of the first one is uh, that the inter intervention from international organization as European Union, World Health Organization, UN, ODC, etc., are the only way to motivate the governments to ensure effective prevention of vulnerable groups. Uh, I mean, during the years, we know that uh, the political pressure from outside of the country is very effective in, in, in our situation. Uh, it's crucial that international do donors increase harm reduction funding in line with epidemiological needs uh, rather than the income level of the country. They must not remove funding until the government commits and delivers theirs. Otherwise, uh, all the good work get, get, gets undone. Uh, it happens with our so-called transition. Uh, the international financial and moral support for NGOs in the region is crucial for improving the answer against HIV and ensuring the domestic funding. Uh, and the international harm reduction players, as Harm Reduction International, uh, EHRA, IDPC, <laughs> etc., uh, need to recognize and support the independent organization in the region and to raise an, an awareness for the specific needs of the countries which are between. between uh, to face philosophical worlds, because Balkans are between the East and the West, uh, and it is very complicated for understanding the place. Thank you very much, guys. I'm sorry for the bad news <laughs> and the bad end, but this is what it is here at the moment. Thank you very much, Julia, and thank you for being with us today. And yes, indeed, um, sharing a very bleak picture from Bulgaria of the current situation of harm reduction programming. And I, you know, I do think it's so important that um, you share this perspective that um, we talk about it, that it is raised with funders and international donors. Obviously, it's been an ongoing conversation with the Global Fund for a long time as well in terms of how they support and manage um, transition. And I think you, you also hit on that in your presentation of, you know, how to convince governments to take up domestic financing for certain, um, you know, communities and their populations that um, they maybe still see as criminals um, and maybe have ideological opposition, for example, to harm reduction. So this is not prioritized under domestic financing models. And this is truly a challenge that we have to seek to address. So I'm pleased to say that we actually have around 10 minutes um, for some um, questions. I have a few questions that I may pose, but um, as we know, um, because of technical issues, our audience participation is somewhat limited. So I'd also invite you to think about, um, as my panelists, questions that you might have um, for each other. But I'm going to start first with a question um, for Ambassador Kirsty, who I hope is still with us um, on the call. And um, my question is um, really relates to um, the CND. So as you mentioned in your opening remarks, over the last few years, Norway has led on several successive health focused CND resolutions that have been really important for signaling the political commitment for ensuring the health and human rights of people who use drugs. 
even though Norway is not currently a member of the CND, um, how, would, how will Norway ensure that this focus continues um, at the discussions in Vienna? And based on what you've heard today, do you think it's time now for a more explicit resolution on community-led harm reduction? Uh, thank you, Anne, and thank you to uh, to all the panelists for really uh, interesting uh, presentations. Um, you pose um, partly a difficult question. I'll, I'll answer the easy part first, uh, which is how do we work when we're not a member of the CND? Well, we stay engaged. Uh, that's what we do. We work with others, uh, and I think um, also when we're a member of the CND, that's how we work. We stay engaged, we work with others, um, uh, try to gain support, uh, support others in their efforts, and I think that's uh, the way you know you build alliances and you try to move agendas and issues forward. When it comes to new initiatives, I think um, any new initiative now needs to start um, with uh, an assessment of um, the current international environment and the added value of any new initiative um, considered when you take into account the possibility of a setback. Uh, because that is what we uh, see on some issues uh, internationally. Uh, so that's the, um, uh, the discussion that uh, Norway and, and all countries need to, to, um, uh, to have before we uh, frame or uh, new initiatives. Having said that, I would uh, then uh, not say that, you know, that leaves out new initiatives. It just says that that's where we have to start. Um, not uh, promising anything, not uh, saying that we, no new initiatives are welcome, but that's the analysis that, analysis that we need to, to do first. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ambassador. And yes, yeah, so well, I hope we can sort of um, continue this discussion with Norway, but also with some of the CND members about um, yeah, what a possible um, next resolution that focuses on, on the health and human rights of people who use drugs might be. Um, and we're hoping to, yeah, this hopefully was a bit of a conversation starter that we had today. Um, so my next question is um, for Louisa. Um, and thank you again, Louisa, for being with us today, um, the only representative from the UNAIDS family. Um, I think my question relates to, um, as I'm, I'm sure you are aware, um, in, at the end of 2018, the UN system um, came together for the first time to release a common position on drugs, um, which was very much welcomed from civil society. And um, that common position um, explicitly says that the UN system will promote um, the decriminalization of drug use and possession for personal use. And we know, you know, as has been discussed today, how strongly that intersects as a driver of stigma and discrimination against um, people who use drugs. So um, I just wondered if, yeah, if you could tell us explicitly how UNAIDS is really promoting um, the, the decriminalization of people who use drugs and perhaps also, you know, if this will be a strong feature in the upcoming UNAIDS um, strategy that's currently under development. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. And let me start with the plug for, we are undergoing the, uh, the new UNAIDS strategy. I know that many of you have been involved in consultations around what has worked with the current strategy, what are the gaps and the way forward. We're still in the midst of developing the strategy. So my, my plea is for engagement. I think there's still room for engagement and to make sure that these discussions and, and the evidence-based evidence interventions and the political will is also garnered through this process. Um, in terms of uh, the, the, the common position, I wanted to, to say that we have a series of tools. Of course, the common position is a critical one to really you know, push from the UN perspective uh, into realizing that vision into country action. But I also wanted to point out that for us, we are we have been partners with UNDP, uh, with the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights around the, the guidelines around drug 
drug policy and human rights. It's yet another tool that we're actively promoting um, as we provide technical assistance to governments. And last but not least, one, one important statement that I would encourage you to use was uh, a statement of 12 UN agencies that came together around what is needed to address discrimination and stigma in healthcare settings. And a very clear recommendation in that statement is law reform, law reform that impacts key populations around, as well as sexual and reproductive health services, but very importantly for this discussion, uh, criminalization uh, of drug use. So what, what we're doing is really, we see uh, the international standards along with all of these commitments and with the common position as a package that, that we use for political advocacy uh, with our country offices and international level. What we need is we have those statements and those commitments. We also need our partners like you, community, civil society, to push us at the UN from the local level, for the, for the national level, all of the UN entities um, where, that are closest to you, all the way to the regional or the global level, to actually apply them. Right, we we push from the global level into for these positions, but we need you all to knock on the doors at national level and escalate and bring the attention to to our issues, and we're ready to help. Thank you so much, and that is a very important and valid point. And I think, you know, that's why as civil society and community working on these issues, we are. Um, you know, we do see these commitments um, and statements from the UN level as incredibly important for advocacy then at the national level to keep pushing this agenda. And thank you for referencing that joint statement on stigma and discrimination in, in healthcare settings. It is a very valid one um, and one that we should hopefully, if Ansela can find it, share it in the um, Q&A as well. Um, so I do want to have questions also time for Adit, Sharan and Yulia to answer questions. Um, I think Adit and Sharan, I will ask you the same sort of question and then if you could just take a, a minute each to respond. But um, it's, it's sort of two questions in one really. Um, you know, what do you think is really needed um, to be able to scale up um, community-led responses? And in parallel, um, how, can how can ensuring community-led responses um, what do you think that the impact is in terms of community-led responses then reducing um, stigma and discrimination as well towards people who use drugs? So I'll um, add it first and then and then Sharon. Thanks Anne. I think um, I mean investment is really the key but it's not just about the funding right I mean it's not just about um, you know, splitting the money, right? But it's really about the being recognized, you know, being um, that the community of people who use drugs um, have a key role in, in ending this epidemic. Uh, and I think that one thing that we have possibly forgotten, or if not, then we haven't really been talking about that much again, is the greater involvement of people um, affected people who use drugs, people living with HIV in all process. Um, and more and more and now we are seeing um, tokenism and you know as long as they are as long as we are invited and that's everything is fine. So that, that's what we've been seeing um, in the last few years and there's not much involvement, there's not much engagement. We're not, we don't know what the design is. We, we, we might be involved in the implementation but it's just a matter of um of you know um ticking in a box so so i guess really we need to push for um the recognition of the importance of the role of um, the community in this um, epidemic thanks adit um and over to you sharon for just a minute as well Sorry, Sharon, I think you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> this, uh, yeah, technology sometimes, yeah, you know, makes you crazy anyway. 
uh, yeah, what I was saying was that I completely agree with um, with Adit um, when we are talking about funding or when we are talking about um, investment. We are not asking for a big chunk of money. We are just asking for certain basic um, um, uh, money that should be available with the with the forum, uh, whether it is at the local level, whether it is at the state level, whether it is at the national level, uh, because without um, collectivization, without uh, bringing in people or without creating a platform, it's very difficult for us to kind of come together and to advocate for, uh, you know, what we know is the right thing to do. Um, uh, and in, in, in to address um, uh, the uh, stigma and discrimination that's associated um, with, with, with us or associated with people living with HIV or with Hep C. Um, during this COVID time, we have um, we have we have shown to the people. We have actually proven to the people. Include that's why I just wanted to share the picture of providing buprenorphine in the police station. So it's kind of a police personals are there. They are also um, recognizing the roles of the community in uh, in in providing uh, services. So that's a way through, and um, that way we will be able to address the uh, stigma and discrimination. And um, I mean, when other people are not doing anything, the community of people who use drugs came together and um, opened up a shelter for um, for drug users who are uh, homeless or who are living on the street to provide all basic um, requirements. So you know, this these are opportunities where we should be, um, where where we are also able to highlight it to the to the larger community that like you know. Um, we are not just a drug user, but then like, you know, we are equally responsible and using drugs is, you know, uh, someone's decision. I mean, like we cannot um, impose on uh, that, that you cannot be using that or you shouldn't be using this. People would continue to use drugs. And I mean, like this is something, a fact that we all know and there's no debate about that. So th there are a lot of opportunities. There are a lot of um, um, incidents where we have, I would say, um, a lot of um, um, practical um, uh, things that has shown to the people that community of people who use drugs can be really responsible and contribute to the um, to the larger, you know, if you're talking about COVID pandemic, now we are contributing to the COVID pandemic, even the drug using community are going to the to the local community, to the general community, to distribute um, P, uh, PPE kits like uh, sanitizer or masks and other things. So that's something that we are also gaining, um, you know, uh, respect. But then for this, uh, we need to have a platform. And in order to have a platform, uh, we need to also ensure that people are connected. And in in order to connect people, we at least need a very uh, basic amount of funding in order to do that. So that's the funding that we are asking for. We are not asking for, you know, 10 million or 20 million, just a small amount of money that can keep us together to, you know, to to, to keep us connected. That's what, uh, yeah, I just wanted to share. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Sharon. Um, very important points. And finally, before we end, just coming to you, um, Yulia. Um, do you, I mean, there's, yeah, I think there's a lot of work to be done on, on the funding um, side of things. Um, of course, we will with you in solidarity and with so many other colleagues who are struggling to find funding. Um, and as you know, you know, together with Harm Reduction International, um, the Strategic Advisory Group really focuses on this issue. Um, just one question to you, as you probably know, the current, um, the EU is currently in the process of um, drafting a new drug strategy. Um, do you think that the EU can play a stronger role to support um, the situation of the funding crisis in Bulgaria? Uh, of course, I think that you can can play a very huge role. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't saw the, the EU to, to not today to do it. Uh, you know, their politic, uh, their politic, which is not uh, to become a part of the internal politic of uh, different members. Uh, so yes, they are working with, only with uh, some kind of uh, 
uh, it is good to do something, uh, but unfortunately, it doesn't look enough important for, for, for Bulgarian politics. Uh, at the moment, uh, we are in a huge political crisis, maybe, maybe you know about it, uh, also, and uh, we can see that for the first time, the European Commission uh, reacted somehow about the corruption in our country uh, and uh, about the the protests uh, with, 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 which are uh, um, which are now about the, something like uh, 97 day to day or something like that. Uh, so I mean, it was the first reaction regarding Bulgaria uh, all the time uh, till to 2007. <laughs> Uh, so uh, I don't think that only the European Union, yes, of course, they, they can make something, they can um, try to explain how important uh, HIV um, prevention is, uh, is for, for the, the community, etc., etc., uh, but we need more serious pushing on the government. I'm sorry about the world. Uh, we need the international organization and uh, like UNODC, like like maybe EMCDDA, because we are speaking about European Union, uh, like um, uh, World Health Organization uh, to explain very and maybe also uh, Global Fund, who have, who have they, the Global Fund have a signed uh, contract with uh, with Bulgaria, with the country of Bulgaria, with the National Assembly of Bulgaria. Uh, that uh, the government uh, will ensure effective funding for harm reduction uh, after the global fund withdrawal. Uh, nothing happens during uh, the last uh, the last year. We are we are speaking about it for more than five six years already. Uh, but unfortunately, we don't have a result. Uh, this is only the decision of the Ministry of Health, and maybe not not even only the Ministry of Health. Maybe this is the level of the government. Uh, so we can see how the stigma and um, discrimination we are speaking about uh, became higher uh, at the moment. In, in, in so we are European member, <laughs> which is strange how we became in worse situ situation uh, during the, our membership in 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 the EU, in the European Union, and uh, we we recognized the European values, and <laughs> it is absolutely strange. Uh, to speak about, uh, and unfortunately, yeah, only my opinion, my opinion, and uh, my experience shows that only the political pressure outside uh, can push our government to do something. Uh, I don't think we are poor enough to ask money from global fund again. It's not fine for me. It's not honest for the countries where we are much. Uh, in 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 our situation, financial situation, we are we have enough money for this, but people doesn't, but but the government just doesn't want to make a, a adequate mechanism for funding the NGOs uh, and to straighten and and to support the NGOs who who already works in the field of harm reduction, but they prefer to separate the NGOs to make uh, some kind of uh, they are domestic uh, NGOs and to fund it, they are uh, useful for them NGOs, not the real NGOs uh, who can uh, be very effective and but also they uh, can ask for more things to come. Uh, yeah. yeah, thank you Thanks. for the question. Thanks, Julia. It is, um, it is a difficult situation. I think you also um, although it is obviously a serious situation in Bulgaria, you point to another trend that we are seeing globally, which is, you know, in general, um, pressure on the space for civil society and a lot of pushback on organisations that um, work in the intersection around human rights, um, human rights defenders, um, public health in particular. Um, so, yeah, it is of concern, but I'm really glad that you've been able to share these um, perspectives from Bulgaria with us um, here on the on the event today. So with that, I'm going to have to close the event because we're just um, out of time, but I'm really grateful to all of the wonderful panelists who were able to join us today to engage in this really important discussion um, ahead of the, the CND meeting next week, where of course 
um, these discussions th these discussions will continue around um, the HIV response for people who use drugs, particularly on, on Monday. Um, I understand that the recording of this event um, will be available um, almost as soon as we close and we'll be sharing that widely. Um, I'd also just like to thank um, my colleagues at Frontline AIDS. Um, Ansela has worked intensively um, with me on preparing this event over the last two weeks, but also Claire and Jess and Maya, there are many others. Um, and also to thank my colleagues on the strategic advisory group to the UN on HIV and drug use, who also helped to conceptualize um, and prepare this event. So thank you very much, everyone. Really appreciate you being here. And as soon as we have the recording, we'll share it and we hope that you can share it widely too. Thank you.